Metzler, and you're viewing The Charge. Today, we are going to take a look at the story of Abraham with Dr. John Golden Gay, Professor Emeritus from Fuller Theological Seminary, Professor of Old Testament. Dr. Golden Gay, thank you so much for being on the show. Okay. All right. So, um, we're going to look at the Abraham narrative, and we're going to start out with uh, how would you situate the story of Abraham within the the book of Genesis? Right. Well, I think the um, the point to start is the way the Ge Genesis starts off with God um, with God's plan A for creating a really good world, and it doesn't work. So he destroys it and tries plan B uh, with uh, with with Noah, and that doesn't work brilliantly either. So he tries plan C, um, and that's Abraham. That is, uh, God is still working at his um, purpose to create a good world um, and to be recognized by the world and relate to the world and so on. But now the way he's going to try doing that is by starting with one particular family uh, and let that family be the kind of bridgehead uh, into um, the world as a whole. And so he um, and takes this 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 man and his wife, and uh, in due course they become a big family and they become a nation. And eventually, um, Jesus is born from that uh, nation, that family. So that's how the plan succeeds rather better than the uh, the plan A and uh, and plan B did. That's the, that's how it uh, fits really as the beginning of that stage in God seeking to work out His purpose for the world. So, how about the historicity of the story of Abraham? What can you say about that? What do we know from archaeology or other texts? Uh, we don't know anything really. Um, I think the way to think about it is something like this. Um, <clears throat> when you read the first chapter of Genesis, you're reading about something that God really did. That is, God really created the world and created it systematically and created a good world and things like that. And then if you keep reading on the story, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and so on, it carries on until Samuel and Kings. And when you get to the end of Kings, uh, you read the story about how uh, the Babylonians um, destroyed Jerusalem. And, and whereas at the very beginning of the story, you're reading something that is kind of 5% um, what literally happened and 95% picture symbols, images of what what, of how God operated. When you get to the very end of that story, at the end of Two Kings, um, you've got something that's more like 95% things that literally happen, a 5% kind of interpretation of it. And, and all the way along uh, the Old Testament story in between those, you're getting that kind of um, balancing, combining of an account of things that literally happened and uh, imaginative ways of portraying it that help to bring home um, the significance of the story, that's the way that God brings things home to people is by having uh, the story imaginatively retold. And so whether you're reading um, the Exodus or David or whatever, or Abraham, then you're reading something that's in between those two extremes in terms of the balance of um, things that literally happened and ways of imaginatively picturing it. But but most of the time, well, more or less all the way through, we don't know really what the balance is, uh, and which doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't bother me now. I mean, I used to try and think about it, but I've, I gave up trying to think about it because we know the scriptures are God's word and that they're what God wanted, and that the stories are designed to uh, to to teach us and speak to us and so on. God knows where the balance is between the history and the um, imagination. If we don't know, it doesn't matter very much, really. It doesn't matter at all, uh, because we um, we read the stories, trusting them, trusting in them as accounts of the way in which God was going about fulfilling His purpose, even though we don't know at all, honestly, um, how far you're talking about something that literally happened, and how far you're reading something that's imagination. I mean, I'm, I, mean I'm, I certainly assume that there was somebody called Abraham, and there was. It, it, the, the whole thing wouldn't make sense uh, if there hadn't been somebody that God took in that kind of way and made promises and so on and so on, because the the story would, would then collapse. So basically, it's something that happened. But we can't um, establish the boundary between imagination and, liter lit and, and the literary. And we just don't have, it's not the kind of thing. We don't know when Genesis was written. 
Uh, we don't know what the archaeological background or anything like that would be. So there's no way of saying the answers to those questions. And what can you say about the structure of the story, of the narrative of Abraham? A lot of different scholars take different views on how to see parallels or chiasm or that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not big on chiasms personally. Um, I think they tend to be uh, come out of people's imagination. Um, the, the story, in a lot of ways, um, well, yeah, in some ways, you, you, there, are, there are six or eight or whatever your stories about Abraham. And um, in some ways, you could throw them up in the air and have them come down in a different order, and it wouldn't make any difference. Because they're all stories about what God was doing with uh, Abraham and Sarah and so on. Though there's a broad um, development in, in the story, in the sense, obviously, that early on, uh, there's the problem. They aren't in the land, and Sarah can't have children. Uh, and they live with the tension, particularly over Sarah not being, have, being, being able to have children, for uh, the first half or so of the story. And then in due course, uh, Sarah actually has a baby. Uh, and then towards the end, there's uh, God testing Abraham and there's God finding somewhere, somewhere to uh, to bury Sarah and God finding a wife for Isaac. So there's a kind of logic about the plot uh, in, that, in that kind of sense. But um, at least as significant is the reading each of these individual stories much in the way that we probably do in our own um, uh, scripture reading, in the way you might read them in church, in which you can read any one of the stories on its own without w worrying that much about how it relates to the story before and the story after. And uh, so uh, Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldeans and then yeah. was led by God to the promised land that became Israel. What can you say about the geography or social customs, the distinctions between these two areas and, and how that might be significant? Well, I don't know that we know a great deal about it, really, partly because um, we, we don't know about the dates. I mean, opinions vary. vary. Some people put Abraham near the beginning of the second millennium. Some put Abraham quite near the end of the second millennium. Well, if, if you're hundreds and hundreds, imagine the difference between us now and, say, 14 or 1500 AD. I mean, the social context, it's got all, all going to be totally different. So you can't tell a great deal from that, I don't think. Um, why? I, I have no idea why God should have taken somebody from Ur of the Chaldees and then taken him on that weird journey around the, the um, Fertile Crescent, because first of all, um, he goes up north uh, west uh, up to Haran, <clears throat> and then in due course, but, uh, southwest into Canaan itself. Why God was doing that? Why God didn't? I, I I don't know. I mean, I can. What I do think I do know. The, the scriptures don't tell us, uh, and the scriptures don't tell us why he ended up in Canaan. Though I think I know, because <laughs> I think the the great thing about Canaan is that it's the um, crossroads of the world. Uh, if we leave out the Americas with apologies. Um, uh, it's it, you're at the the, the cross point, the cross crossover between Africa uh, and Asia and Europe. So if you're going to reach the entire world, as it were, then Canaan would be the central, the, the sensible place to start. The gospel can spread out in all directions from there, as indeed it did um, in Jesus' day when people went into Europe and down into Africa and across into Asia. So you can see why God would would decide that Canaan was a good place to locate the family through whom he was going to bring about the world's redemption. Uh, but but why he started off with somebody across in uh, Mesopotamia and took him there, I don't know. So we see this um, occurrences of social separation throughout the Abraham story. Abraham and his family leave Ur, then he leaves his father in Haran. Um, at different points, uh, Sarah is almost taken away by... Uh, and uh, Hagar, nearly Isaac, uh, and so and finally Sarah at the end. So we see this ongoing um, occurrence. What what could you say about that? What's the significance of that? Yeah, well, do you mean? I mean, they they um, it is God. God is going to um, work through this family, uh, and so the family needs to be a family, uh, needs to develop as a family. 
Uh, and so that's a large part of what's going on there. Um, they aren't actually as, um, and, and yet a slightly odd thing is that the, in Genesis, there's much less hesitation about Canaanites and people like that and Mesopotamians um, than there will be later on in the story, uh, in the main Old Testament story, where um, the Canaanites are much more of a problem in terms of uh, leading Israel astray. There isn't a sense about that um, in, in Genesis in the way there is later on in the story. So it's not because there's something wrong uh, with those other people. It's just not the they're just not the ones that God happens to be working through. And it's important for this family to develop as a family. And the theme of promise, of course, of, is huge. And that's right. central to what happens with Jesus in the New Testament. So we see several occurrences, uh, reiterations of God making the promise to Abraham at different times. And of course, it ties back in to uh, what God has said before. Uh, what is the, the significance of the, the promises and the different versions of the promise? Well, there are two, there are two um, main promises, really, or uh, well, three, if you like. I mean, the two down-to-earth concrete ones are God's going to make them into a big family and God is going to give them a land. Uh, and those are the, the down-to-earth um, things that make possible uh, a special relationship between God and Abraham and co., um, which is the means to which God um, being able to be a blessing to the world. So three three promises, if you like, this being a family, having a land, and being so blessed that the rest, that the rest of the world looks at you and says, wow, if that's what it's like to have God with you, I want to have God with me. Um, and that the point about the promises is that God, the, the point... That, that God is is working towards a purpose to uh, reveal himself to the world, and I guess it's bound to take time. And as far as the promise or circumcision or covenant or other things that we see that are prominent in the Abraham story, what sort of parallels do we see from other ancient Near Eastern cultures or peoples? Right. Um, well, circumcision is... Um, a very prom I mean, a very common practice nowadays in peoples today and all over the world. Uh, and it was a common practice all over the Middle, e the Middle Eastern world, the ancient world. Not everybody now and not everybody then. So uh, from time to time, the Old Testament is rude about those uncircumcised Philistines, uh, for instance. So, but, but most people did practice it. What was, so what happened with circumcision, as with lots of other things, is that God took something that loads of people did and then gave it a new significance for Israel. Well, not only in, in, in the case of circumcision, a new significance, but also most people circumcise when a boy is a teenager. Uh, and what was then new for Israel was circumcising babies. So God said, OK, everyone knows about circumcision. We're going to take that practice. I'm going to turn it into something that works somewhat differently and that's got a special meaning attached to it because it now becomes a sign um, of you being my people. Um, so circumcision is common enough. Um, covenant, the, the Hebrew word that's translated covenant is the same word as the Hebrew, is also translated treaty or contract. Um, and treaties, contracts, covenants um, are common through, again throughout the world. So I don't think there's... Um, when you get when you get into the covenant between God and Israel, then there are parallels between treaties between imperial powers and treaties um, treaties between imperial powers and subordinate powers. Uh, and so you can see that the way in which the covenant was spelt out between God and Israel um, was expressed in a way that would enable people to understand the relationship between God and Israel in light of the relationship between a big power and a small power. Um, I, as far as I know, there, aren't, there isn't a similar kind of um, similarity uh, between the way in which the Abraham covenant works um, and the way that uh, other covenants uh, around there were known. Um, so people, they would, would they have had uh, covenants between their God and the people? 
Uh, I maybe, but I don't. I'm afraid I don't. I don't know about them. Um, I, yeah, I, yeah. But I think there is an important difference, which is that the covenant in Abraham is purely a covenant whereby God makes a promise. And in a lot of ways, the word covenant is misleading, particularly. Um, well, it, it's 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 amusing. It's one of those words which is amusingly different between British English and American English. Um, in in British in American English, you pledge your giving to church, right? But in England, we we covenant our giving to church. Uh, in America, covenant is much more significant for relationships between people. Uh, it's much it's much more important as a political. Um, concept is covenant historically um, in in terms of the the last three or four hundred years of history, whereas we don't we don't use use the word covenant in that same way. So, covenant is quite a kind of mixed word and quite a confusing word if you're not careful. And the thing to see about covenant in the Old Testament is that it's not very horizontal in the way that covenants tend to um, in uh, to, tend to be in the United States. Uh, and and there's a big difference between the emphasis in, of covenant in Genesis, where it's God saying, "I promise I'm going to do something for you, and this is my and I'm covenanting to do that, but you don't have to do anything." Uh, and the covenant in Exodus, where God says, "Okay, I've got you out of Egypt now. Uh, I brought you to Sinai. Now you're going to have to make a covenant commitment to me." There's much more mutuality about the covenant in Exodus than there is about the covenant in Genesis. And as far as the, the story with the kings, um, Abraham pulls off this um, rescue mission with a mm -hmm. little over 300 men. And it mm -hmm. seems like this is the odds are entirely, entirely against him. It, seems, it doesn't present it as a, a miraculous victory, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think what it more shows is that most of the stories when we read those stories, we think of Abraham uh, and Sarah and co as a little family. But suddenly when you read that story, you perceive something that's also true um, elsewhere, but we don't notice it, which is they're a much bigger crowd than you thought. I mean, remember, for instance, just before that, the thing that in a way caused the problem was that there were, so, there were so many of them and they had so many cattle that Abraham's crowd and Lot's crowd couldn't stay together. They had to split up. They were, they were a big crowd. Uh, and so, um, although it's a splendid and brave and in a kind of way miraculous event, you're right, it's not portrayed that way, um, It's portrayed, but it is portrayed as, it is an extraordinary event precisely because he's not just um, taking on a crowd of local people, he's taking on uh, in, an imperial, so an imperial power. So it is extraordinary, but it's it's in lots of ways it stands out It's a very different kind of um, event from most of the stories about being a shepherd and things like that. And as far as uh, Genesis 15, 6, uh, 15, 6, Abraham's faith will be reckoned as righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, within the story itself, um, not looking too far ahead yet to what we see in the New Testament, what can you say about that? Well, the... The, the key thing there is, it, it's, it's, it's about the promise uh, again, that uh, it's very difficult, understandably difficult for Abraham to believe either that God is going to, give him this land, going to give him this land or that he's going to make him into a big people. Both of these are ridiculous things. <laughs> um, and so at the beginning of Genesis 15, um, Abraham says to God, this is ridiculous. Uh, and um, God reaffirms his promise and gives him a sign. And and that's the point at which it says that um, Abraham believed in God and God reckoned it in him as righteousness in the traditional language. But both of those words are can be misleading, I think, because the, the believing, it, it, it isn't merely a believing a piece of theology, it's trusting as, as the, is in the Old Testament belief regularly is. It's not uh, just theory, it's trusting. So what the thing is saying is that Abraham 
believed God's promise and was prepared to trust in it and live on the basis of it being true. And that's the basis upon which um, Genesis says um, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, that, and that word is even trickier. It's much trickier. Because, um, well, we sometimes, sometimes when we're paraphrasing that expression about righteousness, we talk about being right with God. Um, and, and that gets nearer to the resonances of Genesis saying Abraham was right with God. Abraham was in a right relationship with God because a relationship, any relationship really depends on trust. My relationship with my wife depends on her trusting me and depends on me trusting her. Uh, what God's relationship with Abraham and Abraham's relationship with God depends um, on Abraham trusting God. And it's Abraham's trusting in God that means that he's in the right with God, that he's in a right relationship with God. Um, the, the, and so when Genesis says Abraham believed God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness, it's saying God believed in, um, Abraham believed in God and in God's promise. And God recognized that that was an expression of the kind of attitude to God that meant that Abraham was in good relationship with God. And what about the vision? We have uh, God speaking to Abraham about his descendants being enslaved. We have the pot mm -hmm. passing through mm -hmm. the um, sacrificed animals, the pot mm -hmm. and the torch. How is that significant? Well, there is a bit of background to that in archaeology and whatnot, in other, other peoples, um, because it seems that, uh, because if you were, um, uh, if, if you were making uh, uh, an oath, uh, making an, an, an agreement, um, swearing something between two people, then one of the things that you might do uh, is uh, engage in something that in a way was a bit like a sacrifice, but it wasn't offered to God, because it, but it involved the killing of an animal. And then you walk through the parts of the animal and you say, if I don't keep this vow that I've made to you, my fellow, my, my ally, then may the same thing, may God do the same thing to me as is just as I've just done to this animal. Right? So what God is there doing is saying, I'm going to be like that. Um, I'm going to say, if I don't keep this promise to you that I've made, then may I be cut in pieces in the way that I've cut this mm. animal. So it's a way of giving Abraham an amazingly vivid um, evidence of God really meaning his promise. Um, what was the other thing you, you attached to that one? Yeah. So the the prophecy about the oh, yeah. descendants being enslaved. Oh right, okay, yeah. So so God so God is saying that's why God that's that's God's way of um guaranteeing his promise. But he's also acknowledging to Abraham that it's not going to happen in five minutes. Um, in fact, it's not going to happen for several hundred years, or at least several generations. It's a bit difficult to know whether it talks about four generations, and um, it, it might mean four hundred years, or it might mean four generations, or it might it might mean uh, Abraham, Jake, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph um, generations in that kind of sense. So it's a bit difficult to know precisely what it means. But the the point is clear enough, which is this promise I'm making to you, I'm definitely going to fulfil but it's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. Uh, and the reason, the really interesting reason why it's not going to happen uh, in five minutes is that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That is, I'm going to give you this land, um, but I can't just give it to you now because it wouldn't be fair. I'm going to give them loads of chance um, to uh, sort their lives out. And then when they, when they haven't, as it were, they won't be able to complain that I've taken the land off them. But that's why there's going to be a delay to give them lots of chance to repent, which is great, isn't it? Because I need time to repent and you may. <laughs> <laughs> so the story of Lot finds its way in the Abraham narrative and uh, there's a lot of time spent on that. So what is the significance of everything happening to Lot? Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, the, mm -hmm. um, the angels coming, um, Lot's daughters, some very mysterious, strange goings on. Well, the significance of that last one is that one of the things that all the way through that Genesis is doing 
is um, explaining for Israelites how things come to be what they are. And so one of the um, questions that Israelites might ask is, where did those Ammonites and those Moabites come from? Uh, and the story uh, in Genesis 18 and 19 gives them the answer to the question. Uh, another question that they might ask is, why is the Dead Sea as grim as it is? Why is it so smelly? Why is there all that sulfur down there? And the story gives you an answer uh, to that question. Um, uh, they're, they're evidently, uh, the, the, in, Sod in, in, in Isaiah and elsewhere, Sodom and Gomorrah are a kind of um, byword for, for wickedness. Um, and so you can see uh, ways again in which the story answers questions. Uh, the question of God's fairness, uh, is God fair in bringing judgment on people, which is in the background of Genesis 15 in the way that you just kind of hinted, is there in, in Genesis 18 and 19 where, where Abraham says to God, are you really going to kill these people? What if, what if there's 50 good people there? What is it 40? What if there's 30? And so on. And so there's a kind of... Um, talking about how you talk to God uh, about when grim things are, are threatened for people and how and how God uh, manages the tension for God between it being necessary to uh, to bring judgment on sinners but also it being um, not be, you, you're not wanting to be unfair to the people in a sinful community who are themselves not sinners which you can see as a living issue. In Israel itself, all the way through, where where Israel is ba may basically be going against um, Yahweh, but not everybody is. So the question of God, what God what God does about sinfulness. So there's various sorts of reasons one can see why the stories uh, would help the Israelites to understand issues that would be important to them. And the stories of the stories of Sarah that we also see happen with Isaac and Rebecca, where uh, the women are passed off as sisters um, to protect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abraham or Isaac. Mm -hmm. What um, What's the point of those stories, do you think, theologically? Well, I, um, How do they fit in? Well, one of the ways, maybe, maybe it's... Uh, well, there are, two, there are two interesting things about them. One is that... Um, Abraham is really stupid. Um, and the other is that the other guys, the Philistines and the Egyptians, uh, have often got more clue about what's right and wrong than Abraham has. Um, which is, which in some ways is surprising. It's surprising to us when we think that the reason why the Abraham stories are there is in order to provide us with a, with a good example of how to relate to God. But I started off by talking about the fact that what God was doing with Abraham, the, the point about the Abraham stories was to talk about what God was doing with the world. It, what, the, there was no, there's no indication that Abraham, that, that God looked around. Sorry, this my sentences are, I keep collapsing. I'm going to start this sentence again. <laughs> <laughs> Why was Noah exempted from the flood? Because Noah was the great righteous man of his day. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that about Abraham. God, God just fingered Abraham. He could have been anybody. Um, and, and although Abraham does respond to God in faith, as for instance in that story that we were talking about just now, um, he doesn't do that with consistency. Uh, and, and, and that um, reminds readers that the point about all this is not um, their faithfulness to God, it's God's faithfulness to them. Uh, and uh, if Abraham shows himself to be a wimp and an idiot <laughs> and a coward, as he does from time to time, then that actually, and, and, if the, and if other people show themselves to be better men than he is, then that, then that all helps uh, the people listening to these stories in Israel to get the, uh, to learn the right lessons rather than to think that Abraham's some kind of ideal guy. And they actually listen to God through uh, the dream of Abimelech. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That, that it's it's at the background of the story all the time is 
God isn't just concerned about the Israelites and the people to whom God gave his promise. God's concerned with the nations. So uh, we have a, a theophany in the story where um, God and two angels appearing as men come to Sarah and Abraham. That is a, a very puzzling story, and uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Why is it puzzling? Well, God appearing as a man? That's the first that time we puzzling? see that sort of thing. Why is that puzzling? Well, I don't, I don't consider it normal from my experience. <laughs> it's not normal. No, okay. But, I mean, God did create human beings in his image, and he did eventually come become a human being. Now, for, for, um, for God to become a dog might be more difficult because he didn't create dogs in his image. <laughs> But uh, but he did create it. So I don't I don't see God's got ears and eyes and a uh, nose and things like that, feet and hands. So we see it very rarely though in scripture. Oh sure, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. So why did he do on that particular occasion then? What would be would be a fair question. Um, and um, there are, there are two things that happen in the story. Um, one, one is that he reaffirms the promise to Sarah. So he appears in a special way. It's another, it's another way of underscoring the promise that Sarah really is going to have a baby and they really are, are going to become a family. Um, and, and the other uh, thing that, that comes out in that story is that he is on, on his way to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And he didn't need to appear to He could have done that without uh, bothering with that uh, to, to appear to Abraham. But by appearing to Abraham, he does raise those questions about Abraham's concern for the world. So um, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, one of the darkest, most disturbing stories probably in all of Scripture. Uh, but it's portrayed as an evidence of Abraham's, Abraham's great faith. And that's reiterated in the New Testament in a couple of places. And so what, what do you make of that? How, how are we to understand that? Um, well, what Genesis says is that God was testing Abraham. Uh -huh. and, and when Abraham has passed the test, God says, now I know that you really um, fear me and the sense of being in awe of me, being revering me. Um, and the the background, given that that he's um, uh, required to be willing to sacrifice Isaac, is that Isaac is the means is God's means of, is the means of God fulfilling His promise. Uh, so the question is, okay, now Abraham uh, has had his promise fulfilled; he doesn't need God anymore. Um, and and so the what God is doing is discovering whether. Abraham is still committed to God when he doesn't need God anymore. Hmm. But um, as moderns, people living this side of the cross, or even people living this side of the Mosaic law, and people who, who value children and couldn't imagine being asked to do something like that, we go, of course, this can't be God asking us to do this. Um, so there's the whole moral crisis around this. So, well, that, which is a good exa example of that. That's why we have the Bible, in order for it to say things that we don't like. Okay, I mean, keep uh, going. What's the, point, what's the point of the Bible if it just says things that confirm what we think as modern people? So, yeah, it's very challenging. But are we to even, is that even an avenue worth going down? Which, is which an avenue worth going down? I'm considering the moral implications of that, given what we know of the law and especially of Christ. Do we um, just accept it at face value, or do well, we just Well, certainly the, the New Testament doesn't think there's a problem about it. So it does, the New Testament doesn't think there's a clash between, um, uh, between what Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus does and what Abraham did. Rather the opposite. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's not a New Testament problem. It's a modern problem. Um, what was the other thing you said? What what what's your problem about it? Oh, it doesn't it doesn't match the law. Well, 
Um, yeah, but I mean, quite often, God, the, the, the fact that it, um, even if there's a link between, let's, for the sake of argument, let's suppose, let's suppose, as I think is plausible, though it's a slightly unfashionable view, um, let's suppose that one of the points about the story for Israel is that it, is that it um, presupposes the way in which other people did sacrifice children, and for that matter, the way in which Israelites did sacrifice children um, from time to time, uh, as the story in the books of Kings says. Uh, and so one of the, the, the significances of that story for Israel is, is for Israelites is to, is to say, you see, God God said that to Abraham, and then but then he didn't have him actually do it. Uh, so that this it, it, in a, it is a one of the things this story does is explain why the, why Israelites do not sacrifice children. Uh, now, now I think when we were um, uh, there's a great um, song um, by Leonard Cohen. Uh, and another great song by Bob Dylan, uh, two Jews, about this about this story, in which both of them draw attention to the way in which um, no, there isn't no, there isn't one by Lynn, I'm sorry, there's, there's one by Bob Dylan. There's what there's a uh, there isn't one by Lynn, I think I may have mis misremembered that. But there's a poem from the First World War by Wilfred Owen about it, and the burden of the Bob Dylan song and the Wilfred Owen poem is about how, well, at least Abraham didn't sacrifice his children the way we do. Mm. How many thousand people have we killed? Uh, how many Americans and British people have we um, had killed in Afghanistan in the last 10 years? It, it's a four-figure sum. Um, Thousands, certainly. Yeah. Um, so um, it's fantastically hypocritical that we read their story, complain about it, uh, but we're killing our own people all the time. Um, Viet Vietnam, I mean, the, the, the Dylan song was about Vietnam. Uh, how could we possibly, uh, if we were still living in the 1960s, uh, be fretting about Genesis 22 when we're killing so many of our young men in Vietnam? In Vietnam? We're such hypocrites. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and and in the story, of course, God. The, the point is, God did not, in the end, require Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, though Abraham assumed that if he had, God could have raised him from the dead again, which is what God did with Jesus. So the the story it works within a totally different framework from our framework. But but our problem is, uh, we are modern people. We're not. Uh, we don't think in a scriptural way. So we have the, uh, the ongoing story of Hagar and Ishmael. What can you say about the, the parallel between Hagar and Ishmael and uh, Sarah and Isaac? Well, the, is, one of the important things about that is, you, oh, well, I presume you're not Jewish. I am not. Okay, so you and I are the descendants, as it were, of Hagar and Ishmael. Not, not literally, but, but we're not, we are, they stand for Gentiles. They stand for us. They are the the uh, ancestors, at least as normally assumed, of the Arab peoples. Right. Um, so uh, so they invite us uh, into uh, to identify with them and to be concerned uh, about Arab peoples and about Muslims um, who trace their ancestry uh, back to Ishmael. But what's the point in in the story, the juxtaposition back and forth? Well, again, it, what, the juxtaposition, uh, what do you mean? Well, just the way the, the one mother and son relate to the other. I mean, at one point, Hagar is despising her mistress, and then um, Sarah sends her away. And what's the, the development, the plot there? What's significant about that? Well, the, the, again, the, the, the behind, behind the story is God making a promise to um, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, and here is Sarah deciding we need to do something about it, about the, the fulfillment of this promise. And the way in which they do it is by the, ancient, the equivalent in the ancient world of, um, of surrogate motherhood. Um, that is, um, uh, Abraham... Uh, 
has sex with Hagar in order that she may have the ba a baby that will count as Sarah's. She'll be a surrogate mother uh, for, for Sarah. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, as sometimes happens with surrogacy today, that causes a whole lot of trouble inside the family. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Abraham doesn't know how to handle the situation. Uh, so it's one of his wimp moments, really. Um, but part of the background then is, is the fact that but, but what, what the, for Israelites, the story answers the question, where did those Ishmaelites come from? It's like the story, like, like the um, Ammonites and Moabites. Uh, how, how, do we, what, how are they related to us and why are they related to us? Um, and that's the answer. So what can you say about the theology of the uh, Abrahamic narrative overall? What is really, what are the main points that you would sum up there theologically? Well, that, it's the, the thing from which uh, we started. That is, uh, in Abraham, God was setting going um, a plan to, um, be, to, to make himself known to the nations. Uh, he's going to do that. Uh, by um, ma bringing about the existence of this family in this place. Um, and this, this family in this place is going to be the means by which um, he brought about um, him making himself known to the world, which is exactly what he did. That's the key theological um, uh, statement in the story, the key theological point about the story. The New Testament, we talked a little bit about um, New Testament looks at Abraham in different places and particularly the story of Isaac. Uh, what is, how do we see that the New Testament developing the Abrahamic narrative and the, the promise and well, all that? Paul, Paul says um, that what God did in Jesus is fulfill the promise to Abraham. So, so when Paul then takes the gospel around the world, he is bringing about the fulfillment of the thing that had been God's purpose from the beginning. And um, say, if you could give more detail on that. You're asking me about the New Testament. I, I, I've told you everything I know about the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the specifically, what Paul says is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Uh, and, uh, and and it's that pouring out of the Holy Spirit then that is over the, for the gen to the Gentiles, the gift of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles uh, is the thing that fulfills God's promise to Abraham uh, that through him all the nations of the world should be blessed. Um, yeah, that's the basic thing. All right, and uh, one last question, and you already uh, hinted something about this earlier about the character of Abraham. You were saying that he wasn't so much righteous, but was a man of faith. So how can we as moderns, as believers in Christ, what can we glean from the Abraham story to inspire us, to help us be more faithful, to be more Christ-like? Um, well, I think it's that thing that we we're talking about just now is the key thing. That is, for us to be overwhelmed and amazed at the fact that God fulfilled his promise that he was going to make himself known to the world and pour out his Holy Spirit on the Gentile world, uh, and that we who are not Jews uh, are adopted into uh, Abraham's people. Uh, and so we, we now um, are... There's a great verse um, in, in Zechariah which kind of relates to the Abraham promise um, where it says, uh, in those days, this is the, uh, the last verse of Zechariah chapter 8, in those days ten men from, from nations of every language shall take hold of a Jew, grasping his garment and saying, let us go with you for we've heard that God is with you. Now, that's, the language is almost the same, and the thinking is very similar to when Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, I think it is, uh, pictures people coming into the uh, Christian congregation at worship, hearing God saying things there and doing things, and saying, wow, I'm going to come and believe it. I need to come and believe in that God. Um, 
that um, that, that God has uh, fulfilled his promise to Abraham through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit after the coming of Jesus upon the Gentile world. And the idea then is that by virtue of the fact that we have been grafted into Israel, we are the people, we, we are part of the people to whom the rest of the world looks and says, let's go with you for we've heard that God is with you. Good. It's very encouraging. All righty. Well, Dr. Golden Gate, thank you so much for being on the program. Okay. I'm Dennis Metzler, and you've been watching The Charge. We've been with Dr. Golden Gate, Professor Emeritus from Fuller Theological Seminary, discussing the narrative of Abraham. Peace be to you all. Okay, there we did. <laughs>